This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Lori Regan. After earning her doctorate in neuroscience at Harvard, Lori became a naturopathic doctor. In our conversation, she tells me how the stories we tell ourselves can influence the nervous system, how unexpressed love can manifest as disease, and how reconnecting with our blocked parts can help us heal. There's so much here, but her key message? That despite trauma or disease, at our deepest level, our bodies are never broken. This episode is sponsored by The Healing Order, a clinic that empowers patients with a tailored combination of holistic treatments, herbs, and education to support the body's innate ability to heal. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. Dr. Lori, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so honored that you're here. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm honored you did so. (laughs) Um, So can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Hmm. Well, I'm, uh, I'm somebody who grew up being interested in sort of the bigger questions of who we are and why we're here. And when I was younger, I was very interested in the natural world, still am. Um, I remember reading an article in the New York Times Magazine when I was in high school about um, E.O. Wilson, who's a behavioral biologist and ethologist and thinking, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to understand human nature through a way into that that's also just interesting in its own right, is to understand animal behavior and animal communities. Mm. So I went to college interested in studying animal behavior, but I internalized a thought that came from my environment that that wasn't serious enough science. Mm. And so it had to go in a more quantitative direction. Mm -hmm. And it was still interesting to go in that quantitative direction. So I took it to the level of getting a PhD in neuroscience. And at one point later in my life, I actually realized that some of that motivation was that the, the openness and direct knowing that I had as a very young child seemed maybe not like the safest thing to have. And so I started trusting my thinking, which went all the way to the extent, not so consciously in that way, but to the extent of get a, getting a PhD in how the brain works. Mm. <laughs> um, it was a fascinating process. I was in a wonderful department with incredible people, thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. But while I was there, I started, one day I was doing experiments It's called voltage clamping, looking at the calcium channels in rat cerebellar Purkinje cells. And I was listening to Terry Gross, who was interviewing Andrew Weil, talking about when he graduated from medical school at Harvard Medical School, which is where I was doing my graduate work. Um, He said, I graduated being trained to treat patients in a way that I don't want to be treated myself mm. when I'm the patient. Mm. And so he spent a couple of years traveling around the world and looking at different systems of medicine around the world and said, no one system has a monopoly on things that either work or don't work. And he described all these different methods. So it was really interesting to me. I bought the book on the way home from the lab that day and I read it and just started reading a lot about natural medicine. Mm. And it took me to a place where I decided the thing I really didn't enjoy, like I said, I wanted to go do animal behavior. I actually applied to veterinary school and deferred mm. for a couple of years oh. wanting to do wildlife veterinary medicine. Mm. And here I was doing research where part of that process is to sacrifice the animals mm. in order to gain the knowledge that would benefit humans and also animals, but still that part, Mm. I never liked that part. Mm. And here's a way to understand medicine and healing that's really different than that. Mm. You don't have to parse everything apart, right? You don't have to look at every little molecule. There's a way to understand the bigness of who we are Mm. and the process that we're in as being human Mm. and being life. And what made you 
curious to study the human brain and how the nervous system works. Well, part of it I explained, right? Yeah. Part of it was just this, I don't think that was so conscious. There's a part of me that was interested in knowing who we are, what makes us function, you know, through this phase maybe in high school of being more of a material realist. If we, if we understand how our mm. biology works, we'll understand our nature. Mm. But through that phase of starting to read more about natural medicine, I also started reading more about different systems of spirituality and practice. And I just, it kind of went from, okay, it's not all about the biology. That's mm. certainly a valid, interesting part of it, but it's not it's the so whole much picture. Bigger. Yeah. yeah. So I've heard a lot about polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve. Can mm -hmm. you explain what those mean just in simple language for a lot of us who don't know a ton about it? A, li a little bit, but not a ton. Well, many, most of us, many of us have at least heard that term, mm -hmm. vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. And it's a nerve that goes, it, it goes from the brain to the body, a lot to the viscera, it goes to the heart, it goes to the lungs, it goes to a lot of the organs in our digestive system, in our abdomen. But 80% of the information on this nerve actually travels from the body back up to the brain. Mm. So 20% goes, sends information from the brain to the body. Most of the information is going mm. from the body to the brain. Mm. And we've understood for a long time that there's part of that called the dorsal vagal system that is in charge of rest and digest. But more recently, a researcher, a neuroscientist named Stephen Porges has defined this more evolutionary recent part of the vagus system called the ventral vagal system. And it evolved in, it, in mammals. Mm. And it's a part of the system that enables us to be in social connection. Mm. So if I want to make you, if I want to communicate to you that I'm a threatening person, that system shut off and I'm going to be intense and I'm going to stare at you and you're mm. going to feel that, you know. Mm. But if I want to show you that I want to connect, I might tilt my head to the side, mm. I might soften my gaze. Mm. I might go from a really strong, straight voice to one that has more prosody. Mm. All of that process is regulated, at least in major part, through this ventral vagal mm. system. Mm. So it lets us be in social connection. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. How does the vagus nerve influence our behavior or how we kind of go about in the world? Well, we can be in, I mean, we all are also familiar with the sympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system. So that's a different system, but that's our fight or flight system. The dorsal vagal system can either be active when we're in a state of, you know, resting, like I said, and digesting, but it can also put us into a freeze state. So if we've had some kind of experience, it could go into the level of being formally characterized as trauma. We probably have a lot of defense mechanisms that were very adaptive when they were first developed, right? We have a fight or flight response or we have a freeze response. There are many different ways that people in very creative ways are understanding this these days. But we have ways that we respond in the world where we're, we have all these strategies to keep us safe. And, but it keeps us separate in a way as well, mm -hmm. separate from our own deepest true nature and separate from true connection with others. Mm -hmm. So the ventral vagal system is one that we're able to relax mm -hmm. When these other systems, the fight or flight system, that system, you know, of releasing adrenaline from our adrenal glands, that's not only a system that makes us fight or flight. We need that for play. We need that for creative expression. But if there's a threat, it goes into overdrive and, mm. you know, goes into protecting us. So our vagus nerve takes us, get, brings us back into... Well, the 
dorsal vagal ner nervous system can be a, str a strategy that can take us into more freeze or collapse, which mm -hmm. is also a defense strategy. Mm -hmm. But this ventral, this more evolutionarily mm -hmm. recent part, the ventral vagal system, can bring us into a state of connection. Mm -hmm. And social engagement mm -hmm. is another phrase. So does that used. mean it taps into our parasympathetic nervous system and brings us back into a state of homeostasis? Yeah, this is part of that system. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, the sympathetic, parasympathetic, part of the autonomic nervous system, and the vagal is part of that parasympathetic. Mm. On a biological level, what makes the human body and the human brain different from each other? Well, in many ways, they're similar, right? Made of the same molecules, same types of biochemistry. But one thing that's interesting about at least part of the functioning of the brain compared to the functioning of the body is that our brain actually has the capacity to think, to create thought patterns. And those, when I was talking about the, we were talking about the ventral or the vagus system, not just ventral, the, the information that's coming from the body into the brain, there's a way that that our body itself has the capacity to respond to what's happening in our environment in a very direct way, in a very adaptive way. I touch something hot, I pull away my fingers right away. That's a reflex that hasn't even yet gone to my brain, mm. right? That's a signal that's going through the nervous system, through my spinal cord, back out to the muscles to cause that reflex. Mm. Very adaptive. But part of our evolutionary adaptive response is that information all goes up to the brain. Mm. And the brain then says, how do I understand what just happened so that I can avoid that kind of situation in the future? So it's designed to make up, story. understand, make up a story about how do I avoid that? And in many cases, we make up a story that has blame in it. Mm. There's a Chinese medicine system, Chinese medicine system a five element Confucian based healing system that I work with that has a deep understanding that kind of the key for us as humans is do not blame. Mm. Extremely simple and extremely difficult. Mm. But I now understand that to be that blame is a way that I can say whatever happened, I can fix it if I can understand whose fault it is, mm. <laughs> right? If I blame myself and I say it's because I'm not whatever. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not mm. whatever. Or it's your fault mm. or their fault, right? If it's somebody else's fault or if I can <laughs> blame myself, then I have a potential handle to fix it, mm. right? So that I can regain safety. I can control what's happening. But those thought patterns are ultimately limiting. They limit who we think we are. They limit who, what we think we're worthy of, mm. what's possible for us in life, mm. right? So our brains, in the attempt to protect us mm. and keep us going, actually can end up limiting, limiting us. Limiting who we are, yeah. They can protect us immediately, but yeah. then we're tending to hold on to these patterns. Stories, yeah. Yeah, and so in the long term, while say something really traumatic happened in our nervous system one of its responses was to have us dissociate, to not experience what was happening. Extremely adaptive, but that can become a conditioned response. Mm. Or we're constantly dissociating. Yeah, and so we can, re, we can know how to work with, how to regain wholeness. Mm. And part of how we can do that is paying attention to our bodies because our bodies don't lie, mm. right? Where we're holding symptoms, or signs you could call, when the things are happening in our body, if we pay attention to those, they actually are full of wisdom. Mm. We can learn how to be in a really centered, grounded, heart-centered mm. reality where we can, we can regain connection with that ventral vagal system. We can be calm and open and connected to the deepest part of who we are mm -hmm. and make connection mm -hmm. 
There are a lot of different systems doing this kind of work now. One example is Dick Schwartz with his internal family systems or Thomas Hubel who's doing mm. collective healing work. Mm. Many different people, many different systems. And to me, it's all coming together. The polyvagal theory, Deb Dana's work, bringing the polyvagal theory into therapy practice, mm. into very um, practical application for people that have experienced trauma and that are holding patterns that are, were, and still could be adaptive, but supporting that person to be resourced, to be able to regain the connection mm. with the deepest part of who they are, mm. and to be able to regain the capacity to be in connection with others. Mm. Thank you, that's beautiful. Yeah. Just to clarify, can you explain what the five element is? Yeah, five elements is one of the way of understanding systems and how we work from a Chinese medicine perspective. So there's wood element, there's fire element, there's earth element, metal, and water. And there's, we could spend yeah, I know. <laughs> weeks talking <laughs> I about know. that. But it's a system of understanding that if all of those elements, like the wood element is associated with the liver functions, and in Chinese medicine, liver isn't just our physical liver, it's actually a set of functions associated that we associate with the organ of the liver, but much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So that's the wood element. Our heart is the fire element. Our spleen, which is really digestive function, mm -hmm. is the earth, lungs associated with the metal element, kidneys with the water. But it's a whole way to understand anything that you look at in what we'd call, we could call the macrocosm of the outer world or the microcosm of our body, mm -hmm. we can understand within this those elements. five elements. Mm -hmm. And if they're all flowing, mm -hmm. if they're all flowing one to the next from wood to fire, to earth, to metal, to water, back to wood, then we'll be healthy. Mm -hmm. And in one of the systems, that I've studied this five element Confucian emotional healing system, it recognizes that at the deepest level, we call it five elements, which makes it seem like it's elements, like, you know, <laughs> from the periodic table, that they're physical, <laughs> but ultimately in, at the foundation, they're really about five relationships. It's all about relationship and movement. Mm. And I could go back to sort of a discussion we had about how the light, how the energy from oneness manifests all the way into physical form. And when we form those stories, that's going to change the way that we behave, mm. right? It's going to change the way that we act. And so for us to be in the clearest alignment with our most essential true nature, we act out of something called the. D-E, like people are familiar many with the Tao Da Jing. Tao is that oneness. Da is how we bring that oneness into the world. Mm. And it's ultimately through our actions. Are our actions in relationship to others and to nature, are they expressing the virtue, if you will, of these five elements? The virtue of wood is compassion. The virtue of the heart is Li, mm. the sacred connection. So are we acting from a place of connection and love or are we act, acting from a place that's been conditioned mm. by a fear response usually mm -hmm. that's, that's not bad or wrong, it's just limiting. Yeah, limiting. Yeah. So in the West or countries that have adopted Western systems or traits, how do we think about the body and how should we think about the body? I know when we were yeah. talking earlier, you were talking about how um, we think of the body a little bit like how a mechanic fixes a car. And I'd love for you yeah. to kind of give that analogy. Yeah. So we do grow up, at least in this culture, at least I did, thinking of the body as being something that can break down like our car or our television set, you know, <laughs> something that mechanically goes wrong. And it, you know, it's easy to understand that because like 
You know, mm -hmm. we can break a bone. We can get a cut. We don't fix we our TV can... sets, though. We <laughs> That's right. Now we, we just toss get a new one. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes we do that as well. We toss the part, right? We yes. toss the part. But I think a more complete way to understand it is from this, I mean, one way, many indigenous probably all mm -hmm. indigenous mm -hmm. cultures hold this more complete awareness of not just the earth plane of, of reality and existence, but more of the unmanifest or the energetic realm. And so we can understand our bodies as being that energy condensed into matter and so the way that our bodies, like I might have a symptom that actually, if we're dealing with it from the earth plane, I might need to um, use a drug to change that symptom, or I might need surgery to change that symptom. And those things can be extremely beneficial. It's not to negate the value for people and when those things are needed. However, there's another there's a, another whole realm of possibility, mm. which is, and we've seen this in this healing work, seemingly miraculous changes can happen. Mm. The person who founded the system was a, a peasant saint who lived in Heilongjiang province in the no northernmost part of China. And he was born in 1864, but he did a lot of this work in the early 1900s. And he himself, was a boy and grew into a man who was highly regarded as somebody who had this incredible integrity and lived from these Confucian values in this pure way, including the most important of the Confucian values, which is Xiao, X-I-A-O is the transliteration, is a value, a virtue that's about having deep care and love and respect for parents and elders. Hmm. And the way to understand that in that system is that's what the universe gave us as our, mm -hmm. you know, our, our connection to the universe is through our parents and our grandparents and our elders. Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, he himself was really critically ill in his 20s. He had an abdominal abscess, so festering for more than a decade and nothing treated it. And somehow he came to the understanding that despite the fact that he held this, you know, these, he was a very virtuous person, he held a tremendous amount of negative thought and emotion toward people that didn't have his level of attainment. Mm. So when he realized that in a way he was hypocritical mm -hmm. and he took responsibility for that and he actually felt remorse for the fact that his behavior had had this negative impact on others through his judgment and his anger toward others, not outwardly expressed necessarily, but still held in his system. That was the root of his disease. And literally overnight, this potentially life-threatening illness he had went away completely. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so his father died and he stayed in a burial hut by his father's grave as traditional Confucian practice. And during that time, he had a deep understanding of how disease manifests in the body in a really specific way based on where we're holding these negative mm -hmm. thought patterns and these negative emotions. Mm -hmm. So interesting. <laughs> so there's, and he, it was, it was a time and a place in China where people were really poor. They didn't have a lot of possibility for medical treatment. And so he really promoted, he was illiterate. He didn't have the opportunity in his life to learn how to read and write, but he spent his whole life devoted to teaching people about this system. He realized that the mother in the family was the one largely responsible for the education and the welfare of the household. And so he created 700 schools for girls across mm. Northern China wow. that largely exist still today. And he devoted his whole life to, to giving people this understanding that it is a diagnostic system, but it doesn't require any outside treatment. Mm. We have the capacity ourselves to heal ourselves, to connect with the places, to not blame ourselves for having them. It's a normal human process to have these mm. patterns, 
but to be able to connect with them, to allow them to regain the flow, if mm -hmm. you will. These places that are contracted and simply holding limiting patterns of meaning can gain, regain safety in the connection through our own heart. And it's helpful to have, you know, helpful to have mm -hmm. the heart of somebody else in that process, but can unwind and regain that flow. And mm -hmm. so he supported a lot of people to regain their health without any external yeah. things. It's such an interesting thought to think about how powerful we are if we just kind of shift it's almost like a lens, right? You just shift it, that we hold that power to basically like heal ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that power doesn't... Instead of coming from the outside, which we've been sold in this right. culture, right? Like everything. Yeah. And that we need to have more and more and more and more sophisticated Western science. And I, you know, I'm... And there's a place a scientist, for it. Yeah. right. Yeah. I'm not negating that at all. Yeah. But if that's what we think is needed, we're going in this more and more and more microscopic direction, parsing things apart. But in the process, forgetting unless the whole, we honor the and recognize the whole, we've lost mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of value. Mm -hmm. We often live, live in our heads and our minds and our stories. Why does that happen? Um, I know you kind of briefly mentioned kind of a child that has a, um, you know, either inherits a certain mm. experience or has a certain trauma, like say verbal or physical abuse yeah. um, and no longer can feel safe. Can you just, um, you know, talk a little bit about that and then also talk about how does one start to heal from that? Yeah. Well, we, that process that we talked mm -hmm. about of, you know, something happens that is threatening something happens in our environment that's threatening or we perceive as being mm -hmm. threatening, right? Because it's, we all, many people now have heard about the ACE scores, mm -hmm. the adverse childhood events mm -hmm. and the relationship between the ACE scores and adult disease. Mm -hmm. But the ACE scores are really just about what events happen. What's really key is how your body, how you interpreted yeah. Yeah. what happened, yeah. right? Different people will interpret the same event mm -hmm. in a different way. Yeah. But we, you know, and there's a whole conversation mm -hmm. out there about constitutional types and, you know, what we inherit from our parents. And you could talk about, you know, different systems of understanding when and where you're born and how that affects your constitutional makeup. There's a Chinese system called Bazi Suanming that does that, and Western astrology has some understanding of that. Um, but we will respond to things in a way, and our body has these natural mechanisms that we've been talking about. About okay, now how do I how do I have to behave? Do I have to be perfect in order to stay safe? So everything has to get done, everything has to be perfect, or do I have to be caustic? Do I have to be sarcastic? Do I have to be funny? Mm -hmm. Do I have to hide? Do I have to be out there all the time? You know, we all develop these different and different ones, maybe in different situations. Mm -hmm. um, the, these patterns that we adopt. That become who that we, we are. Adapt, yeah. That it become the lenses through which we, we see, see the, the world. world. Yeah. And so then our experience is gonna solidify the patterns that we already have. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways now that many people are learning how to kind of drop away and to, to regain um, a centered, heart-centered. We never lose our heavenly nature, if you will, what Chinese medicine called xin. Mm. But we can absolutely lose connection with it. Mm. And Almost awareness like all these of layers it. kind of come to, yeah. you have to kind of peel, peel the layers. Peel away the <laughs> onion and get back to that. Yeah, so we mm. can do practices I mean, different forms of contemplative practice. Some, you know, meditation is a word that is a really wide Huge. encompassing, yeah. right? But practices that bring us into that awareness of our heart. And I think it's particularly valuable to bring us into awareness in connection with our body, right? To learn how to feel our body, to listen to our bodies, to when an emotion arises, to not suppress that and it. not project it outward, but mm -hmm. to listen to what's the message in that mm -hmm. emotion. 
Yeah, I feel uh, what one uh, I was doing a somatic tra training recently, and it was all about how do you relate to the emotions that come up? How do you develop yeah. a relationship with them? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're back to that concept. Really key relationship. Relationship. The duh. So I was talking about relationship when I mentioned it before about relationship with others. But it's exactly, I'm glad you brought that up. It's also relationship with, with these different parts of ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Right. And how do we, you know, the part of us that's trying to protect us by, by say, being addicted to something. Mm. Another part of us might hate that part because we don't want to have that addiction. But the part that's expressing the addiction is really trying to save us in some way. Mm -hmm. So how do we integrate? How do we, how do we create a whole system inside? And how does our deep heart that discerns a deeper, deeper truth and reality about our true value and mm -hmm. our true worth and our true existence and our most essential nature, how do we get a, how do we reconnect we tap, yeah. with that? Tap back into it. Yeah, and it's not by cutting off all these other things, it's by integrating all these parts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Internal education, if you will. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. wild. We could spend a whole lifetime just getting to know ourselves, right? Yeah. Well, I think to me, that's what... <laughs> that's the work. That's what our lifetime <laughs> is, regardless of what we're doing. Um, that's the ultimate thing yeah. that's happening. Um, just a, uh, one question, because it comes up a lot. What does it mean to leave our bodies? I'm sure there are people that could have studied that and can talk about it very specifically in terms of the neural mechanisms. Um, but we can, there's a way in which when our spirit is fully embodied, that we are, it's like spirit in our earthen vessel. But there's a way that the way that the limiting patterns that we've been talking about can form a constriction where there's going to, we're not going to be fully embodied in that way. And that can be a root of cancer as well. Mm -hmm. Like the cells are not getting that pattern information fully from our spirit. And so then the cells are not getting the information they need to differentiate fully mm -hmm. or any other kind of symptom, right? But it can become extreme so that we're no longer physically our spirit is no longer physically as deeply rooted in our body. Mm -hmm. And that can be mm. a kind of dissociation. Mm. And there, there are other ways to understand it from, you know, what's happening in the prefrontal cortex and other neural mm -hmm. mechanisms. But before sitting down today, you mentioned three ideas that really stuck with me. Um, so you said, at the deepest, our bodies are not broken. Yeah. Which is like a really powerful thought. And then you also said disease is not a mistake. So for a lot of people, just that thought is quite powerful. Yeah. Right? Because we always think like when something happens to us, I get cancer, you know, there's anger, there is resentment, this body's failing me. Yeah. You know, we're kind of like, I mean, even just the, you know, how we how we talk about disease we need, we want to fight it we want to go you know right. it's it's like all the right. language right we're we're at war with our bodies right um and then at the yeah. at the, the last thing you said was and this one was like almost chokes ch chokes me up you said our bodies show us where love is not available so could you just expand on such profound statements? <laughs> and I would, I would tweak that last thing. They're showing us where love is available to be received, mm. where it's not currently being received. Mm. Mm. And I want to take great care here because somebody could interpret this conversation as, oh, if, there's, if I have disease, it's my own fault, mm. right? And I don't think of it like that at all but to give a kind of possibility, to open a possibility that, yeah, we might need surgery, there might be a great advantage to a drug, but there are many natural ways that include our own awareness like we were talking about. There are ways like natural medicine, to me, natural medicine has its, at its very nature is to get to the root of where the restriction is 
And that restriction is going to be the place where we form one of those limiting patterns, where we felt like it wasn't safe to receive the love that's available, mm. to be in the flow, because this flow gave us this experience that was traumatic or difficult or challenging. And so I form this constriction, constriction in a way, but that's a constriction in the flow of chi from energy, right, or vital force or energy, which will restrict the flow of blood will restrict the immune flow, immune system in that area. And where we, we can't, no matter how careful we are with our diet, we're all gonna take in toxins. We're mm. all gonna breathe in toxins. We all get exposed to things. Where are they gonna tend to stay in our bodies? They're gonna tend to stay in the places that have less flow, mm. pretty naturally, right? So we will manifest disease around these places where we have the limited patterns of meaning. And it's really cool that we're gaining, that there's so much wealth awesome. of information out there these days and coming together. Like I'm doing a course series right now with Dick Schwartz and Thomas Hubel, who I mentioned, who decided let's do a course together to see the commonalities and how we've approached trauma and mm -hmm. this limiting disease and maybe what are differences between how we work mm -hmm. just in the diversity of the beauty of what's mm -hmm. available. But many different systems are coming together now, Eastern, Western, um, of this common understanding that's leading us to, to this same idea that you brought up, which is, hey, there's there's a lot through our own ability to connect with this deepest part of who we are. I mean, Einstein said the most important question for humanity is, is the universe a friendly place or an unfriendly place? He said, because if it's a friendly place, then the actions that we take, the things we develop, where we put our attention and our energy, the science that we develop, the way we practice medicine, all of that is going to be informed by this sense of trust and love and connection. Mm -hmm. But if we think the universe is an unfriendly place, us, yeah. then we're going to be putting our money into, you know, munitions and barricades, and we're going to, our bodies can be our enemy, mm -hmm. and we can, you know, live in fear that our bodies can betray us yeah. and that other, you know, so there's a way, he also said, if it's neutral, if the universe is just a neutral place, then why does it matter? <laughs> it's all meaningless anyway. <laughs> we may as well get what we can, you know, we may as well be out for ourselves mm -hmm. and be in a selfish, you know, narcissistic, <laughs> I, I'm not, those are not the words that he said, but. You know, he did say, if it's neutral, then it then it's, doesn't hold meaning. Mm. Mm. Just really quickly, you said, um, all disease starts in the heart. What does that mean? So it goes back to this idea of our heart energetically, the xin, X-I-N in Chinese medicine, which the character xin doesn't have what's called a flesh radical meaning xin in Chinese, the heart is not our physical heart. That's the earthling, earthly vessel for our heart. But the xin, our, our spiritual heart, if you will, our spirit is the place where we can hold these limited patterns of meaning that can then- Influence our body, our physical matter. Figure the energy goes into physical matter. Sometimes it's hard to even imagine feeling better and healing what does it feel like in your body to release limiting patterns and become more free? Mm. So just personal. Well, it means having the courage and the support and the connection. So often the deepest things I will, I can do this work myself, but I'll often go to a practitioner who I trust to help hold the heart container for the process. Mm. And what it feels like it's different every time, but it's an internal awareness, a going inside, a feeling, a physical sensation. Often, very often, there'll be an emotion associated with that. It's having the courage to feel that emotion, 
Mm. and just let it flow let and it open. Move. And there's some kind of release that happens in that process, mm. some kind of increased awareness or flow. Mm. I can give you, you a you, you feel it, right? I feel it. Yeah. You, yeah. Feel, it. you feel the shift that happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's so powerful. Yeah. That's why it's a daily constant practice. Yeah. Um, what does healing mean to you? It means reconnecting with that deepest, most essential self. Mm. You mentioned um, something called the path of the virtuous person. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So the person I was talking about who started this Confucian five element <laughs> system, that's his system. So uh, okay. the, it's in Chinese, it's Shan, S-H-A-N, Ren, R-E-N, Dao. So the Shan meaning good or virtuous or real, doesn't mean goody goody as we tend to interpret good, I have to be good. Mm -hmm. It means living from a place of connection Virtue. where I can act out virtuous, yep. you know, in relation to others and internally. Um, Ren is person and Tao is path. So the path of the real person or virtuous or mm -hmm. most connected essential person. So it's just a way, it's just the journey of being able to connect with these places that are um, holding the limited meaning, that are kind of storing these. I always hesitate here because the words that want to come are negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put the connotation of motion is negative. Mm -hmm. It has a function. But if we hold it and project it, either inside or outside, mm -hmm. which starts with blame, mm -hmm. then it does have a negative mm -hmm. effect in the sense of limiting us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What does it mean to express our highest potential? Good question. <laughs> I think ultimately, we have a Ming, we have a destiny that is an expression of your unique gifts, my unique gifts. Each of us is gonna express that in a different way. And if I'm connected to that kind of purest light within, then I have the possibility of creating. And in my experience, um, my understanding, I certainly wouldn't in any way <laughs> like say that I'm there, um, <laughs> but the, the true heart is always in service, right? So I know I'm not there if my concern is like, what's in this for me? But the, the, our ultimate destiny and our ultimate, what was the wording that you used? Highest potential. Highest potential is gonna be our highest expression of service, not only to humanity, but to the earth, mm. to other beings, to the universe. It's gonna be an expression that's in connection, that's in flow, mm. that's expressing the unique combination of who I am. And, you know, mm. we all have different bodies, we all have different gifts, we all have different expressions of the combination of these five elements in that system or whatever system you talk about. Um, we all have something unique to express. Mm. I think like that's also, our highest potential. It seems also connecting to our deepest selves as part of that, right? Yeah. And it's a way that, you, if you will, like Chinese medicine again would say there's heaven and earth, but the human being has the capacity to express heaven on earth, mm. to express our most essential, clear, pure nature, creatively, playfully, mm. you know, it's not about being above and, you know, this sort of like mm. dissoci or it's about being full mm. in the fullness of who we are in connection, mm. seeing the highest in others, even when they're acting from their limited thoughts mm. and beliefs. And it doesn't mean, <laughs> Um, I think it's a conversation happening a lot in Portland these days, right? <laughs> like the people who are like, oh, you're way too compassionate toward these people that are causing all the problems versus, no, we need to take care of them. There needs to be clarity. Mm. There's a healthy no in Chinese medicine. There's a healthy bladder function that sets up a healthy border and boundary, mm. but not There's with a no closed bad. heart. Yeah. 
Mm, right? So there's a whole set of functions that are all part of the process in expressing the fullness of who we are. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Lori. Um, I really appreciate all your wisdom. It's been super lovely connecting with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's fun talking about these things. And I, <laughs> I give all the credit to all the people that I've learned from and all these systems, and it's a lifelong process of, of course, we understanding all do. and embodying. Of course. Yeah. Of so, course. Thanks. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.